Welcome to Halting Toward Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land, talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Rachel Wojtek, and we have been in Greek philosophy for a while. Um, We are going to tackle Aristotle today, um, but before we do that, we kind of want to just tap back to our main trunk of the tree, as it were, um, and orient ourselves in world history at large. Where is Israel in all of this? Why are we here? What are we doing? (laughs) Well, questions that are good to ask yourself now and then. Yeah. So that you see the ebb and flow and the uh, consequences of ideas. In Daniel 11, the revealing angel stands before Daniel and says, also in the first year of Darius the Mede, Cyrus the Persian, even I stood to confirm and to strengthen him. And now I will show thee the truth. Behold, there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia, and the four shall be far richer than they all, and by his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Grecia, uh, Javan or Ionia. And a mighty king shall stand up that shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. And when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken and shall be divided toward the four winds of heaven, not to his posterity, nor according to his dominion, which he ruled, but his kingdom shall be plucked up even for others besides those. And that leads us on to the Hellenistic Age, which will begin next week, I hope. But this gives us not an exact time frame, but at least it gives us some idea. Daniel is at the beginning of the Persian Empire. Uh, He's there when Cyrus the Persian, or Darius the Mede, same person, takes the kingdom from Belshazzar, uh, and the angel says there will be um, three more kings in Persia, and the fourth shall be richer. So four kings that he's going to talk about. That doesn't mean there's only four four kings left in the Persian Empire. But these are the four that the history books usually remember, and the fourth is Xerxes who leads the invasion of the Greek mainland. And then having brought us to Greece, uh, we then make a temporal jump forward uh, a number of decades to the coming of the great Grecian king, technically Macedonian, but (laughs) speaks Greek, looks like, you know, when it quacks like a duck and walks like a duck and walks like a duck. And really wants to be a duck. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) You call him a duck. So uh, that's where we are because... This this fellow we're talking about uh, right now, Aristotle, is the teacher, tutor of Alexander the Great. So that gives you some kind of, of time frame. What's happening in Israel right now? Um, well, Israel is part of the Persian Empire until Alexander comes along and makes it part of his empire. And then he dies real fast, and then that's the Hellenistic Age, and that's where we're going And the story then gets a lot more complicated. So we've passed the last of the Old Testament prophets. We're past Nehemiah and Malachi. We're in the so-called 400 silent years. Um, Nothing really huge is happening in Israel at the moment that we know of. And so we're, we're looking at Greece. Why are we looking at Greece? Because again, Western historians, philosophers, scientists, men of letters, look back to this particular time in Greek culture and Greek history and say, that's it. That's the pinnacle of ancient history. That's the golden age. That's the greatest. That's where all of our ideas come from. Man became man there, to borrow a phrase from Edith Hamilton. So we've been looking at the three greatest philosophers at least the three that the history books generally at least give a nod to, Socrates, Plato, and now Aristotle. Socrates taught Plato, Plato taught Aristotle, Aristotle taught Alexander. So you want some kind of time sequence, there you go. That's that's kind of where we are. Uh, as, a, as a teenager, Aristotle enrolled in Plato's school and spent a good deal of time arguing with his teacher. <clears throat> and went on, <laughs> went on to found his own school, a little cushier and more plush, uh, called the Lyceum. And um, 
felt free at that point to disagree with Plato left and right, and yet it was Plato he was disagreeing with. So Plato continues to form the backdrop of what people are going to say after him. Somebody someplace said that all of the history of philosophy is a footnote to Plato. That may be an exaggeration. Uh, more probably to the point, it's a footnote to Plato and to Scripture, as people <laughs> have tried to see if there's some way we could harmonize or balance these two or make them friends, and there's not. But we're really slow on the uptake here. Uh, Aristotle didn't agree with Plato on everything and so tried to soften some of his views. Uh, he was, um, if Plato was a generalist, for lack of a better word, uh, Aristotle was a man who was into details. He was a botanist, a zoologist, uh, the originator of species classification. He wrote books on poetry, on Metaphysics and physics, you go, go down the list. There's hardly anything he didn't write about. And he actually looked at things. He picked up rocks and leaves and animal carcasses and looked at them and tried to learn from them. So this is, this is not Plato anymore. There, there's a difference here, and we, and we need to talk about it. Uh, you're both familiar, of course, with uh, Francis Schaeffer's introduction to Plato and Aristotle. Mm -hmm. One of you want to explain it for our people who are listening? You're talking about the School of Athens, the yeah. painting? Yeah. Uh, so there's that great classical painting, the School of Athens, that portrays uh, Plato and Aristotle walking together in the, uh, in the Forum in Greece. I suppose that's where they are. Um, and Plato's hand is pointing upward. I think he's got one finger mm -hmm. to point to the great unity, the forms, the ideals. And Aristotle's hand is stretched out with his hands, his fingers spread towards the earth to emphasize the the particulars, uh, the the things that are individually known. Um, which is a good, quick reference. Um, you just can't take that too far no, <laughs> and be can't. fair to Plato and Aristotle. <laughs> yeah, because we are dealing with the Greek worldview in general, and these are variations on it, not radical departures from it. Right. Uh, we're still dealing with form and matter, but whereas Plato shoved his forms, his ideals, his archetypes into some kind of transcendent reality that even he couldn't really put a label or address on, Aristotle tried to find form in things themselves. And the best illustration I've seen and borrowed and sold and used for years is you come to a vase, a vase, whatever you call it in your part of the country, and you know it's a vase because it has the shape of a vase. It ha literally has the form of a vase, but it's made out of ceramic or glass or some such thing. And, and so Aristotle would look at this and say, I, I can touch this, I can feel it, I can see it, I can smell it if I want to even taste it. And that all tells me something of the nature of the material substance that goes into this, the atoms, if you will. But to understand that it's a vase, having seen it, my senses have to relay to my reason, my soul, um, what it is I've come in contact with. And then my soul, having experienced vases before or the and, and now has this idea of vaseness. So these are the things that make a vase a vase as opposed from being a jar or a glass or a cup, um, my reason is able to, to recognize that formal distinction that's actually present. And, and, and so knowledge happens. So Aristotle, while recognizing that uh, unity and truth do lie in this rational dimension, uh, has brought it, as it were, down to earth and can justify going out and looking at this rock versus that rock. This is granite. This is mica. This is feldspar. Because reason is capable of gaining information from the empirical senses and comparing it to absolutes, to archetypes. Well, granite in general is like this, and this meets all the qualifications for being granite, so I deduce, you know, and so on. And so with this this or that sort of bird or fish or whatever, 
And so Aristotle was was able to do justice to things in common human experience, far more than Plato ever was, and write about them, keep records, and begin this whole process of species classification, and become what was extremely odd in Greek culture, a working scientist. <laughs> um, because despite everything we have been told about h- how these um, these philosophers were actually natural philosophers, which is the old word for scientist, they generally weren't. They didn't. They didn't go out and look at things. They didn't touch things. They didn't compare things. They didn't weigh things. They didn't match this with that. They just thought a lot and asked a lot of questions, many of which had no answers. But Aristotle actually did something that we would look at and say, "Yeah, that's science." It's the beginnings of science, at least. Now, what he he wasn't always consistent. There are some things you can find in his writings, and unfortunately, I didn't write down any of them just for fun. But but things where he just said, I, I think one of them was that men and women have different numbers of teeth. Yeah, that's the one I was thinking of. <laughs> yeah, never occurred to him apparently to actually ask his wife or any other female to open her mouth so he could count them because. <laughs> We're still mm-hmm. rationalistic. We're, 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 we're working with what we assume, with what we know. And even this great father of science couldn't be bothered to count the teeth in a woman's mouth. So that's, that's what we're dealing with here. It's um, worth noting also when it comes to physics and metaphysics that physics is the book he wrote first. And right. then metaphysics is not named metaphysics because it's about philosophy as opposed to science. Right. It's the, the, translated. It means the sequel to physics. Yeah. After um, physics. These are not two separate <laughs> pursuits in Aristotle's mind. Um, yeah, I have his, uh, his metaphysics. I don't recommend it to anyone in particular, unless you want to be able to tell somebody, yeah, I've read Aristotle. <laughs> Which may sound a little impressive to somebody, someplace, but not once you've read it. I think you will realize it's not that impressive. Um, it's more worthwhile to read other things by yeah. Aristotle if if that's your goal, <laughs> just to be able to say that you read them. Yeah, there's 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 other something else you could read. Uh, poetics comes to mind. Poetics or politics. Yeah, yeah. So here's here's Aristotle. Things you should know. To, um, Student of Plato, um, teacher, tutor to Alexander the Great, uses his mentor Plato as sort of a um, sounding board of, yeah, he said that, but he's wrong, so let me tell you what's right. Or he kind of goes on the right trail, but let's see if we can't tweak that and fix it. Uh, About the only other thing that comes to mind in terms of practical details is that a very, very, very long time later, medieval Christendom would hear that their Arab neighbors had discovered books by this guy, Aristotle, and that all the cool kids were talking about it, and they wanted to to read it too. And the Pope said, no, pagan, you should not be reading this. <laughs> but you know how it is when you tell your kids not to read books. They get their flashlights and go under the covers at night and <laughs> read the books anyway. So eventually one of the popes said, all right, fine, we'll, we'll sanction Aristotle for being read by people who are smart enough to do that, but we need an interpreter. And he found this monk from the town of Aquino, a man named Thomas, uh, who was authorized to be the official uh, interpreter of Aristotle. And from there we move from... Um, Aristotle is just this name and these books out there, which were never lost in the East. The East was very familiar with them, except they were in Greek, and the Western Church didn't speak Greek, neither did the Arabs, but the Arabs got them translated. So finally, they have to get translated into Latin so the West can read them. And and now we begin to get a number of ideas that begin to influence the Church. And some of this we will most certainly come back to, probably all of this will certainly come back to, if we ever get that far. (laughs) <laughs> if we ever get to the 1200s in our discussions, right now we're still <clears throat> 490 years or so before Christ. Uh, I, I suppose the thing, at least that I would like, well, two things I would like to emphasize, I guess. One, uh, Aristotle has brought form 
um, truth, unity, the ideal, the archetype, down where we can touch them. Whereas Plato locked them up where you, the soul can perhaps remember them, but it's sort of an other otherworldly out-of-body experience to do so. You have to get past your body to remember what you knew. C.S. Lewis has a nice line in The Allegory of Love. He says, hence Plato with his transcendent forms is the doctor of the Protestants, Aristotle with his imminent forms, the doctor of the Catholics. In other words, that may sound to seem a little um, vague and highfalutin, but what, he's, what Lewis is saying is Plato emphasized ideas and the mystical and the spiritual without any f- physical thing mediating it. Uh, descend into your soul and find God or escape your body and reach out and touch the infinite. That's a gross misunderstanding of Plato, but at least you can see how someone who's into Plato's way of approaching things can end up there. Mm-hmm. Aristotle's approach was more like, go pick up this thing and see, experience the truth that's in the thing. Now, as a philosopher, that doesn't go very far, but the moment you translate that into religious or ecclesiastical categories... Sacramentalism. You, exactly. You start mm-hmm. finding God's presence in things, whether it be the sacraments, the bread, the wine, the water, or whether it be in icons or in uh, relics. Um, the crucifix. C- crucifix. Um, well, you can see how that... Um, the sort of, I want to say hyper Protestant because I'm thinking of um, sort of Methodism and sort of Zwinglianism um, fall into Plato's error of yeah, there yeah. is no physical communication between right. God and us. Um, so we would say both of these are wrong, right? <laughs> yeah, and and that's what I think what Lewis was was getting at. The uh, here, here's a line from a. a group I know nothing about. It's called Atomic Opera. What and the song, that <laughs> that's the name of this musical group, apparently. Okay. And their song is called Jesus Junk. Mm. And the line that I have in front of me is, give me a piece of the true cross, the thigh bone of a saint. I long for something holy. Now, I don't know the con, I don't know the song. I don't know the context of the song. I don't know how serious the author was. But taken seriously, um, that's a good uh what marker of 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 a healthy part of, of American Christendom. We feel closer to God when we have, well, Frankie Schaefer called it praying hands and pressed muck. But you know, <laughs> some kind of tangible thing, a cross, a picture, a necklace, a chain, an icon, a Bible verse on your on your tennis shoes. Uh, that somehow makes us holier. And that's more Aristotelian. That's bringing uh, the holy down into things that we can touch and and taste and handle, as opposed to simply finding Jesus in your heart. So we, we still are dealing here in America, in the 21st century, with two different takes on Christianity, both influenced by the Greek worldview, but one more Aristotelian and one more Platonic. To which I think about the only thing you can say is, yay. <laughs> as, because as you say, this, neither one of these is particularly Christian. The Bible does not disdain physical things. It does give us bread and <gasps> wine. <laughs> Gasp. Gasp. Yeah, I mean, part part of the American tradition is the rejection of wine because it's in in the Lord's Supper because it's it alters your body chemistry. Mm-hmm. It's it it plays with your body so that your soul loses control. That's obviously sinful. So there's no way Jesus could have put that in the Lord's Supper. And if for the moment we admit that he did, well, that's good and all, but that was he's perfect and we're not. So we need to bring this down to a level where we're not. Uh, presenting a bad testimony to the world and not tempting people because, you know, one drink could turn out, could make you drunk or you just may be constitutionally bent that way. And so yeah, we got to put a fence around this tree of knowledge of good and evil. We shouldn't know. be touching it. Mm-hmm. Don't even touch the thing. Well, uh, I think one of the things that 
um, I've noticed and often when I've talked about these things with my students have mentioned is that most other religions besides Christianity offer external markers mm. for you being a part of that community. Right. Um, and while we do have external markers in Christianity, there are things like baptism <laughs> And taking of the Lord's Supper, those things that, in a sense, disappear right. physically after you partake in the sacrament. And they're yeah, not you things can't you can't tell by looking at somebody if they've been <laughs> baptized. Right. Yeah. You don't walk around with your like eternally wet head or something, <laughs> um, or like remnants of wine on your lips. Um, and so I think <laughs> there's a tendency in our flesh to want to find ways to show off physically. Uh, that we belong to Jesus, and yet simultaneously we often shy away from the actual ways we're supposed to show yeah. that we belong to Jesus mm -hmm. in speaking about him and living according to his ways. Instead, we want to be, as we've said, a silent witness, and yet we want to wear our cross, and that's going to be how we're going to tell people we belong. Um, we want to hope in these physical things, mm -hmm. um, but it's really uh, an idol because it doesn't yeah. speak um, and we aren't speaking either. Yeah, that's so fascinating, that tendency where, especially I think in the evangelical church today, there's such a de-emphasis of baptism and the Lord's Supper, mm -hmm. um, the two things that we're supposed to be doing. Um, mm -hmm. And yet there's, oh, well, um, once you become a teenager, you should probably wear a purity ring to show that you're committed to <laughs> living or, according to Jesus' law in this particular aspect of your life. Um, and like the for a while there, it was the WWJD bracelet, right? Or yeah, the, something like that. So we come up with our own fake sacraments because yep. we don't want to be legalistic about the real ones or something, mm -hmm. and it's it it just seems messed up. Well, I've, yeah, I've been thinking about that, where when we try to be non-legalistic, we end up becoming legalistic still. Are about we, our own things. <laughs> yeah. We say, oh, the commandments are too, if we get too close to the commandment, we're too likely to, you know, hurt somebody. Or I've been thinking of it in terms of the abuse culture, where it's like you can't even get close to saying people have to obey those in authority because that's mm -hmm. too close to being abusive. So we have to build all these walls mm -hmm. around these so that authority can't have as much power over us to um, prevent abuse. But in the process, we're building our own little fences, just like yeah. the Pharisees. Mm -hmm. Which will, in the long run, turn out to be just as abusive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because when we Even run- more so when we run from one abuser, having realized, wow, this is abusive. I will run over here. If we don't come to terms with our own sin in the matter mm -hmm. and our own need for Christ, we will run right in the arms of another abuser who will say, oh, I understand you. Yes, they're terrible. Let me support you. Let me help you. Let me embrace you. Resistance mm -hmm. And give you a whole new set of words you're not yeah. allowed to use. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um. But until someone is born again and has their mindset changed radically, you just you run from one legalism to another. Because the original temptation was you shall be as God, mm -hmm. making up your own rules, deciding for yourself what good and evil are. That's how God knows good and evil. So if you're not going to embrace God's rules given on God's terms with God's explanations of how those rules work, legalism is, is inevitable. It's just a question of whose. Mm -hmm. Um, and is it going to, in here, looking at the influence of Greek culture, are we going to tell you, and you must have a crucifix or a cross and you must, um, start listing, you must have, what would you have in that culture? T-shirts with Aslan or Jesus on them. And what would Jesus, we start loading people with stuff or do we tell them, ignore food is not an issue. Sex is not an issue. Money's not an issue. How you dress is not an issue. How you behave in church physically is not an issue. As long as your heart's right with God. And we fall into some kind of Platonism, Neoplatonism or Gnosticism because we, when we reject God's order, there aren't that many other options out there. They're, they're all humanistic and it's just a question of which side of the coin are you going to deal with? And uh, 
they are pretty much the same coin. It's uh, human autonomy. Mm -hmm. uh, we we resent God's law because it's obviously evil. Uh, because we've been abused by people who who believe in it, and rather than finding out what does God's law say, we simply reject the whole thing and go run to somebody else who has their own rules mm -hmm. and that sound good for right now, but give it a generation. Or please don't. <laughs> please don't. Yeah. Because Sinclair Fer Ferguson talks about this in his lecture series, The Whole Christ, mm -hmm. um, where antinomianism and legalism are this they're the same error, oh. which is neglecting, forgetting that God is personal, yes. that the law is the reflection of his nature, and he personally loves us and has yeah. given these things for our good. The, the the impersonality of God is a real problem, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we don't we don't solve it anywhere in Greek thought for sure. No, and and that brings <laughs> us back to the other thing I wanted to talk about. Uh, when it comes to natural theology, Aristotle again is a starting point for Rome as for anybody else. Uh, he he came up with an argument for the existence of a god. Mm -hmm. Or more than one God, depending on how you read it, of some sort. Here, here's the argument. Everything moves, but an infinite regress is undesirable. The Greeks were not fond of infinity. You can't keep going, but well, this was moved by this, which was moved by this, which was moved by this, which was you can't go back like that forever. There has to be a place where you stop and say, and this is where it all started. And then, of course, the five-year-old, but who moved that? No, you don't understand. Nothing moved. Well, then how does it move things? Because it's moving things, then it's moving. No, no. It's <laughs> it's an unmoved mover. What? <laughs> well, okay. This is how it works. Imagine, imagine a young lady whose uh, husband has been serving overseas, and she's heard nothing of him, and is afraid he might actually have been killed, and there she is on the couch praying and weeping, and suddenly the door throws itself open, and there he is standing there with outstretched arms, but not moving. And she gets up and she runs across the room and throws herself at him. See, he didn't move, she moved. But she moved in response to him, he's an unmoved mover. Except so he had to move to get there yeah. for okay, her well. to then run to. But you know, I yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all, all illustrations are limited, including this one. Um, <laughs> anyway, so a couple things here. First of all, they're just going with, with what Aristotle actually tells us. To be the original thing that starts things, it, the thing must be pure. Uh, existence. It must. It, it. It can't be becoming. It can't be matter. It has to be pure spirituality, pure rationality. That is, it's mind. But here's the thing: mind has to think about something, and for mind to think about anything less than itself is unfitting for such mind. The only thing really that a perfect mind can think about is perfection. And within this closed system, the only perfect thing it knows is itself. So the unmoved mover is sheer intelligence contemplating its own existence. That's it. That it, does not call into being anything <laughs> else. No, just... the universe is eternal for Aristotle. Mm -hmm. um, the universe is, but by being this perfect thing... Other existent spirits, intelligences within the universe move in response. They're drawn into action as the young lady in the illustration is drawn to her lover, to her husband. And so the sentient universe moves, dances, spins, does something. Um as it contemplates this perfect thing, thinking about itself and, and basically being closed off. Now, this if, if, if we stop there and say, and this is God, he's the unmoved mover, he's the first cause uh, in, in this kind of thinking, uh, he doesn't communicate, mm -hmm. he will not turn his face outward, assuming he has a face, he will not talk to lesser beings, he is not interested in prayer or worship or praise, he does not control the universe. He does not answer prayers. He he doesn't do anything except think about himself. We have words for people like that. 
<laughs> Narciss <-absorbing>. Narcissist <laughs> comes to mind. <laughs> Psychopath is real close. Yeah. So um, we do have a sort of metaphysical distinction between the things that exist and God. But in no way is this a creator creature distinction because no. the God in this illustration cannot interact with anything beyond outside of itself. Right. Uh, because that would be lesser. That would be, yeah. And, and so there's a question of whether or not it's, it is even aware of the rest of the universe because to take its mind off itself, even as a glance to see what's out there, is one, changing and mm -hmm. the absolute must be changeless. Mm -hmm. this, this is going nowhere. Yeah. Uh, and yet this has been one of the arguments that's been used by Christian theologians and apologists to show that there are logical arguments for the existence of God. Yeah. Can we point out that the part of the assumptions that make this line of reasoning uh, quote unquote work <laughs> is the rejection of the idea of infinity. Um, yes. You have to assume that infinity is impossible in right. order to get to the point where there's an unmoved mover. And later in philosophy, philosophers came back to this and said, well, it doesn't have to be a line. It could be a circle. Right. And just everything's causing everything yeah. else. Um, so it's, if you're a student of philosophy at any point beyond <laughs> um, Aristotle and Aquinas, you know that this doesn't quite answer all of the objections. <laughs> yeah, I'm just thinking of Stephen Hawking's and his... Um after he wrote A Brief History of Time, in which he acknowledged that, you know, a lot of people are afraid of the idea of an absolute beginning because it might suggest an absolute end, and I can see how that would... In his next book, he came back and said, wait, never mind, I can explain how there's no end, no beginning and no end and how the universe just is. Okay, so we can do infinite regress within the system and it doesn't... We don't need a beginning anymore. Um. This is this isn't a philosopher exactly. This is a physicist and one of the most respected mm -hmm. of the last generation. So you're absolutely right. It just it, saying infinite regression is impossible. Uh, the proper response is who says? And and what are you assuming to pull that one off? Well, I can't figure how that would work. Who made you God and judge? Mm -hmm. Just because you can't figure? Can turning to Christian apologist, and can you exactly explain how God exists? absolutely independently in his in and of himself apart from all other things do you understand the nature of god's existence well no then really you're at, you're you're undercutting paganism which is great as far as it goes but the same acts can go the other way at your assumptions there's there's more going on here and we need to have a, a broader perspective a uh, side issue uh in uh, metaphysics. Aristotle has a, a chapter. It's called. They're, they're they're numbered after the Greek alphabet. So this is lambda, L. Um, and having talked about this idea of an unmoved mover, he he takes a sidetrack and says, "Now, how many are there?" We thought there was just one. No, uh, actually, and he goes on for two or three pages to explain how there might be quite a few actually. Um, I don't remember if I put the number. Yeah, from 47 to 55. <laughs> uh, one for each of the heavenly spheres. And it, I've re I read through it before we started, and I don't understand all of it. It's He's using vocabulary and assumptions about the uh, cosmology of the universe that I'm not completely familiar with. But that's that's not the point. He He does admit that he's not talking about necessarily a monotheistic God or even a Unitarian mind. He's willing to allow for a whole bunch of these things. Now, how uh, do they work in tandem? Um, are they like clocks in a clock shop where they all tick together despite the fact they're unconnected? <laughs> but then having done this, he then immediately turns around before the chapter's over and argues that, well, maybe there's only one, and he concludes with, and that is what religion tells us after all, isn't it? Wait, what you're describing is not the god of Greek religion. So what? Um, yeah, for, for a man who is considered one of the most brilliant in the history of Western thought, he, 
has it some issues like with think, yeah, <laughs> thinking in a straight line. In the uh, who the translator of this particular version basically says it, it's it's a little murky here, <laughs> and some people think this is just an interpolation because we don't know what in the world he's saying, and it doesn't really seem to make any sense. Okay, so you're. I think what you're saying is that somebody else added this and snuck it into the manuscripts, which is not impossible. But I'd like a little more assurance, like maybe some manuscript evidence that actually shows that rather than he's being really dense here. So let's just assume someone else added it afterwards. <laughs> no, pagans can actually be stupid. Because sometimes and so can Christians. And so can Christians. Yeah. Because sometimes our sin drives <laughs> yeah. us to it. We we mm -hmm. walk ourselves into a box and we can't find a way out. And so we write down really stupid things and hope in time that people won't. We don't we we, we don't play Augustine and write our confessions and retractions. We just hope no one reads the out of print stuff. <laughs> um, <laughs> so that's. Uh, that's our, I think, introduction to Aristotle. We we probably don't want to miss though his um, the contributions he makes to education with the idea of the mind oh. as the the un unscribed tablet. Unscribed oh, yeah. tablet, yeah. Um, because I, yeah, I think that's very. Uh, I mean, we can see connections to it in our modern public school system, but I think it in general, has contributed a lot to culture in the sense that knowledge is our gateway to truth mm -hmm. and to um, what has been natural law and all of this, where we can, in a sense, by our reason, figure things out um, as we experience them, which is both uh, an important part of science, but just education in general, because I don't remember. I was looking back through some of the the books on Aristotle and Aquinas I read in college, and I don't remember which of the two of them said it, maybe both, um, that it is important to have a proper education for children because that is what forms them into being proper and good adults. Because if they are not educated in the good, then they cannot know the good and do the good. Mm. Plato said something very similar. Um, mm -hmm. Because we we are stuck. This this is the thing. When you abandon a Christian worldview, then you abandon sin, and so sin can no longer be the explanation for things that go wrong, mm -hmm. and that leaves you with basically. Well, it leaves you with your environment, and that environment comes in two forms: what's within you, genetic. often contrary to your choice. We would say genetic inheritance. Uh, and what's without you, which you also, m most of the time, have very little to choose. Arist uh, Plato, when we were looking at him last time, had the had the quote of, almost all of men's problems are the fault either of a faulty uh, education or, uh, what was the other one, ignorance, something. One, one he ascribes to lousy parents and the other to um, the world around you. And they, yes, that those are the options. Mm -hmm. Um if you don't believe in the effects of sin on if you do the, not believe that sin nature. is a real thing and once you yeah. once you eliminate a creator god you have eliminated sin mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because if there's no creator who owns you absolutely and can absolutely command you then what you're left with are mere preferences i don't you like rape i don't you like abuse i don't you like mass murder i'm kind of not fond of it myself but you cannot bring anything as a standard. This is just your chocolate and vanilla. And you can, well, that's monstrous. Well, you, there you go. What's wrong with monsters? <laughs> um, where, where are you dragging in these moral absolutes? Ethics as a category disappears. And, and we didn't talk about Aristotle and ethics. We could do that too, because he, he feels this. Uh, he's left with, well, there aren't really any rules. Um, Men are going to want to be happy, so they're going to pursue their happiness. And practical advice is that uh, the more human we are, the more we understand what it means for man to be man, then making choices along those lines will probably be good. And so he proposes uh, the golden mean. You don't want to um, eat too much or too little. You want something in between. 
You don't want to run away at the cracking of a twig, nor do you want to stand and face five dragons. There's something in between there. There's always an in betweenness that reason properly exercised and trained can find for you that will make you happier. But that's the best we got here. We don't have any kind of idea of holiness or an absolute transcendent justice. We just have, well, how do you get along in life? Because ethics has vanished and epistemology, how do you know and how do you know you know, can't be affected by ethics. It can simply be affected by metaphysics. Well, what's real? What is man? How is man made? How is he constituted? Um, can we change that constitution? Can we change his environment? Uh, I suppose the other thing that we haven't mentioned is Plato's most, or Aristotle's most famous quotation, man is by nature a political animal. What uh, he said is, man is by nature an animal who lives in a polis, and he who by nature and not mere accident is without a polis is either above humanity or below it. So from his point of view, it's the state, it's the state is the outward form, the ideal that defines mankind. Conform to that and you will find your true happiness. If you don't need a polis, it's either because you're a god or you're a beast. There are no other options, which would explain why Socrates doesn't drink or drinks the hemlock rather than escapes from Athens. Mm -hmm. Man is defined by his political environment, which is what the Republic is all about. And so Aristotle has not gone very far from Plato. Mm -hmm. Details, yes, some uh, particularly in the realm of epistemology, but in terms of education, in terms of uh, politics, uh, we're, we have not moved. We are still solidly in the Greek worldview. We're still solidly pagan, humanistic, satanic. Um, and my current theme that I, that I am always harping on, and this is a man who we hold up to Christian graduate students as an example of how to think, how to find the truth, the beautiful, all of that. I don't think so. <laughs> and it, it, it frightens me that th th there's two things going on here. Those teachers who propose to do that, they've got two problems. One, apparently they either they cannot read and have not read Plato, Aristotle, and they're faking it. Now, I'm, I'm all for good fakery. I've been called <laughs> a charlatan before and, and freely confessed to it. But when you're charging lots and lots of money to parents to teach Aristotle and Plato, one would think that you read them with, with understanding. If you did, then the other thing that you have to call in question is, do you understand the Bible? Do you understand the confessions and creeds of the church? Well, we don't even have to get to the confessions. Let's just look at the creeds of the church. Do you understand what it means to call God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth? Do you understand what it means to say that Jesus has two natures, one human, one divine, and they are not mixed because there's no mixing of the human divine? Let's just, let's just go that far. Do you get that? Do you understand the nature of sin? And if you don't, why are you teaching in a Christian university? And why is this difficult? Um, I, I am concerned about these things. And one of the things I hope that comes out of this podcast is that somebody someplace, after getting angry with us or with me, <laughs> will stop and say, wait a second. Wait, how do you put those together exactly? <laughs> uh, it, in fact, this, this is not that, but this uh, is kind of an echo of that. Um, before I taught at my current Christian school, I was in another Christian school up north, and the new headmaster was very much into um, Americana, you know, founding fathers, mm. the Constitution, and all that. I will not. He was he was very much a gentleman, so I don't want to disparage him. Some of his followers, not as much, um, or the people that were in the same movement, I should say. Um, but I in I had his son in my class, and I made some very biting comments about John Locke, along these very lines of uh, tabula rasa, the, the unscribed mind and all that, that uh, this is what Locke said and he's wrong. And so word got about and I was asked that at the next educators conference, I go sit in on the uh, lecture given by a very nice lady about John Locke. She was writing a biography and I needed to go listen because obviously I didn't, this was unsaid, but it was implied. I didn't understand Locke well enough. Um, the lady was indeed writing a biography, 
but it was a, the kind of biography that he was born, he grew up, he wrote books on Christian stuff, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, and uh, somebody raised a hand and said something, I don't know how it came up exactly anymore, but there was an article, they said, in the Calcedon Report, back when it was called that, on John, John Locke's humanism. And everyone in the room being akin to this movement kind of laughed and chuckled and guffawed. John Locke, a humanist, ha, 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 he's, you know, he's our idol. In some ways he was. Um, and, and one gentleman who was actually the father in the musical group that was singing for this, this uh, meeting said, I think what they're saying is that his view of the mind as a blank tablet is contrary to the idea of total depravity which is exactly what they were saying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the nice sweet lady said, oh, really? I don't think so. Oof. No, no, I'm sure that that's not what he would say. And at that point, game, set, match. Um, mm -hmm. You obviously haven't thought a thing about Locke. You don't, you're not equipped to. You don't understand theology. And yet here you are trying to write a book about it. No, I'm, I'm sure she's a nice lady. I've, I've heard about her from other sources. I mean, a sweet lady who means well. But she's not equipped to discuss philosophy because she doesn't understand the first thing about theology. And I kind of, you know, went home whistling my way. Like, I didn't have to say anything, praise God. I didn't have to put myself <laughs> in any more trouble. Um, but I think that is a good example where Christians are often um, off their guard when philosophers seem to be taking the practical, logical approach where they're yeah. just observing the things around them and saying, this is obviously true. And we as Christians would say, yes, this is obviously <laughs> true. But it's true because God made the world to work that way and it reflects his character. But we get pulled into that so-called neutral ground, mm -hmm. that natural law that we can all share, um, which really is a false teaching we can find from Aristotle. But I see yeah. that so often of, yeah, I know they're pagans, but they're so logical and practical, so we can learn a ton from them. Um, and we miss why their foundation and their worldview matters um, in and, all the and, things, therefore they get wrong. And why what we think they're saying may not be at all what they're actually saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, precisely. We, we are reinterpreting in terms of our categories, and they may mm -hmm. mean something very, very different. Mm -hmm. For instance, when Aristotle says God, he it has nothing to do with the God of the Bible. And there's no way you can stretch. I was reading um, a book, I forget what it's called. It was a, the author is uh, Mortimer Adler, who is mm. a, a scholar of... Yeah, How to Read Persons. a Book, that guy. Yeah, yeah, How to Read a Book. This was something like that with Aristotle. He said originally it was going to be a children's guide to Aristotle or something, like that, but it's <laughs> a little too sophisticated for that. Uh, but when he got to talking about Aristotle's theology, it was an interesting chapter, more or less what I've just said. He summed up well. But he tried really hard to reconcile what he knew Aristotle had said, <laughs> that this God of his, and he does not admit that Aristotle allows for multiple unmoved movers. He just, okay, this one God is eternal, but so is the universe. So this God isn't a creator unless we tweak the meaning of the word create to mean, and I, I had trouble following exactly what he was saying, but I think what he was saying is um, just because something has come to exist doesn't mean it cannot fall out of existence. So to sustain something in existence could qualify you as a creator. This is bending the Bible to fit <laughs> Aristotle rather than saying, yeah. oh, here's Aristotle. It's not the Bible. What if we yeah. engage with Aristotle <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and compare it to the Bible? Yeah, and then we would, we would be able to confess with the three great religions that God is creator of heaven and earth. But we would mean something radically yeah. different. Mm -hmm. And I'm just, I, I, and I don't think that Mortimer Adler here was was being vicious. I mean, he, it's right out in the open. It's, it's not sleight of hand. It's just, well, what if we did this? And it's, it's sort of maybe, maybe not. That's a humanist on a good day playing nice and trying to be sweet and accommodating. 
not all philosophy teachers or historians are like that. Many of them will just swish something by you or by your children in college, and sometimes they will do it in the name of Jesus. Um, we we need as Christian educators to start drawing those lines hard and fast and saying, you want to ta start talking about Aristotle and Plato? First of all, tell us everything wrong with them. <laughs> tell us how which articles of faith they flatly contradict. When you're done with that and we know that you understand theology, then you, if you have something you still want to tell us, maybe there's something in there we can hear. Mm -hmm. But just starting with, no, no, we'll, we'll, we'll listen to them and learn from them, then later we'll critique it a bit with Scripture. No, 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 no. <laughs> Not on my watch. You don't get to do that. First of all, you're going to bring these guys along. You know, it's, it's, yeah, I brought this child molester and this uh, pimp in here to your kindergarten class, and they're going to tell you interesting things about the business world and human relations. And we'll critique some of their um, practices later. I don't think so. Yeah, don't like that. <laughs> oh. But of course, I would be called harsh and judgmental and all kinds of things, anti-intellectual, <laughs> for suggesting that moral confrontation takes place at the beginning, not later down the road when we maybe get around to it. So there's yeah. my warning. And there we have to wrap up because uh, we are over time. But before we go, let's have some recommendations. I got one. Anytime you go more than two hours away from home, make sure you have your go bag with you, which contains <laughs> changes of, of underwear, socks, a different pair of shoes, <laughs> some snacks, a uh, charger for your phone. It uh, feels like you're speaking from recent experience. Yeah, <laughs> That's the impression. <laughs> very much. Very much so. This kind of thing has happened before, but it happened to us this a couple of days ago. We were took a... Uh, Quick break to run down to Carmel. It was a great experience. Wonderful time at the beach. Came back and our alternator went out along the way. And we had not been planning for an overnight trip. Now, in my case, it's a little more uh, serious because I have sleep apnea, which mm. is to say I can't sleep very well without my CPAP machine. Um, and, and neither can anybody else in the room. <laughs> Uh, fortunately, we did have some um, earplugs in the car. So I told my wife, okay, before we do anything else, before we go to sleep, put in the earplugs. Mm -hmm. She tells me she didn't hear me snore all night. So that's good. I, on the other <laughs> hand, had difficulty staying asleep and woke up not feeling well. But that's me. But we all have, a, do you, do you take your medications with you. Uh, make sure you have a, some kind of little medical kit with you. All those, there was a time, I think, in America where we did those things because uh, the highways were still poor. You didn't know where you're going. There's an old I Love Lucy episode. I don't know if you've ever seen it, where they decide they're going to drive across the country to California. And the whole rest of the sea of their, that comedic season is set in, in Hollywood. But along the way, there's maps barely existed then. Mm -hmm. I mean, this was in the, in the 50s. Yeah. Our late our early 60s. Maps were, mm -hmm. were rare. The roads and highways horrible. There were phones. Huh? <laughs> you sure didn't have one with you. You were lucky if it found a phone booth. Anyone remember those? <laughs> um, and Lucy and her friends end up at some weird little um eating place that has a some beds attached. And it's just, everything's just horrible. And so they said, we're not staying here. We go and they go and they go. And then they finally see a sign that says, um, restaurant this way, 10 miles. And so she follows the sign and ends up in exactly the same place. <laughs> and they end up trying to sleep. and try, Because in those days, you didn't have all the... We, now you, you carry a phone with you. We were in trouble because my wife's phone almost ran out of power. Fortunately, we had landed in a Coles parking lot before they closed and she ran in and found this little Disney nightlight phone charger <laughs> <laughs> plugged into the wall. Because, <laughs> you know, oh, then we can always power it with the car, not when the car has no battery power. <laughs> right. Yeah. So think ahead. It's a good thing to have. If you're within two hours of home, you can call a friend. When it gets around four, four hours away, that's four hours out to you and four hours. And you want to take eight hours out of your friend's life? Mm, maybe not. <laughs> So, be, be like a boy prepared. scout. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or like Scar from Lion King, you know? Yes. <laughs> One or the other. 
Yeah. <laughs> Emily, your turn. Oh, I am struggling because the recommendation that came to mind uh, during our conversation is one that's definitely not for children. Mm. Um, it's a sci-fi TV series by Joss Whedon called Dollhouse. Mm. Um, I don't recommend watching it per se. Um, I like to watch TV with a Sudoku puzzle in front of me. So a lot of visual <laughs> things uh, don't bother me because I just don't see them. Um, but the Yeah, my wife watches with her hand up in front of her eyes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and there's a lot in, in this series that would require such measures. Um, I quote unquote watched it in college. So I was doing homework at the same time, mm -hmm. which was a great blessing. Um, but what's so noteworthy about it is the way that Joss Whedon begins with this assumption of tabula rasa, the, mm -hmm. the, um, what do we call it? unmarked tablet? Yeah. Unscribed tablet. Um, yeah. And so the idea is that people can be restored to that clean slate mm. state and then we have the technology to imprint a personality on them and memories on them, and we can make them whatever we want them to be and then sell them, or rent <laughs> them rather. <laughs> um, so again, not for children, not for uh, the timid sensitive souls. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, but the way the story is told over the course of the two seasons is really... Uh, excellent uh mm -hmm. in the way that he comes back to that assumption because you know you and i watch this show and we're like yeah that tabula rasa that doesn't work does it um, <laughs> so uh how's this gonna fall apart yeah and then you get halfway through the show and joss whedon says yeah that falls apart mm -hmm. <laughs> let's look at how um and i love that about joss whedon the shows that he makes begin with one set of assumptions and then he comes back and challenges them himself mm -hmm. Um, and I think that's really good storytelling, especially uh, when you're dealing with such um, poor assumptions as he yes. usually starts with. Okay, Rachel. So mine is mostly unrelated to what we talked about tonight, I think. But um, I recently finished reading um, or rereading for me, uh, Son of Hamas. Mm -hmm. with my husband, David. And so I have recommended it to many people over the years, but I'm going to do an official recommendation here. Uh, it's an autobiography by Mossab Hassan Youssef. And it was published a little over 10 years ago. Um, but given all of the uproar in the Israeli-Palestinian issues, I think it's a good it's a good and useful tool. Uh, it was actually interesting right after we finished the book, uh, the, the back of the book has a list of names and kind of definitions of the key players in the Palestinian-Israeli issues. And recently, um, a primary Hamas leader was killed in Iran. And David actually went back to the book and looked in the back and went, hey, I found him right here. <laughs> um, so demonstrating he'd been around for a long time. But the overall gist of the story is Mossab is the oldest son of one of the founders of the Hamas group in the 1980s. And so it's his own journey seeing life in the West Bank in the 80s, 90s. And then he gets wrapped up in uh, espionage with the Israelis while also trying to care for his father and seeing the horrors of Hamas. Um, and then eventually actually is introduced to Christianity. Uh, so it's a very interesting story that leads to the proper answer for the conflict of uh, if you just try to solve it as nations with diplomacy, with espionage, all of it falls apart and just keeps perpetuating the problem. Um, they need the love of Jesus. So uh, it's a pretty easy book to read. It is not, I would definitely say not for children um, because it does describe some of the horrors of Hamas. Mm -hmm. um, but it is, it's a good look into that whole situation. Great. Well, thank you both so much for this conversation. It's been a delight. A uh, big thank you also to David, our producer, and my lovely wedded husband. And a huge thank you to our financial supporters. Thank you for keeping the show rolling. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, if you'd like to get in touch with us, you can always send us an email at haltingtowardszion at gmail.com. We would love to hear from you. Anything else we need to say? 
I'm getting shakes of the head, so I will say goodnight. Thanks again for listening.